Yeah, so um, I'm sitting right here on Healdsburg. For those who know where Healdsburg is, we are one hour north of the Golden Gate Bridge, which uh, during no traffic, and that's exactly what, well, we have limited amount of traffic here at the moment. Um, people are hunkering down a little bit, so a lot of people working from home, just like you guys are. And the town of Healdsburg is really unique because it sits on the border of four Appalachians. So we've got Alexander Valley to the north, Dry Creek to the northwest, uh, Russian River to the south and west, and then Chalk Hill to the east. In the town itself, we have registered wineries, 220 registered wineries in, in, with a Healdsburg address. So it's a very popular place to come. And in our heyday, pre-COVID, we had 38 restaurants uh, here. And um, a lot of them uh, uh, are still open because we have a out outdoor dining is permissible. Uh, as far as tasting rooms and visiting us, we have a brand new tasting room that we only opened last weekend, which was also interesting, opening a new tasting room during the COVID. But I'm hosting two large groups out there on Saturday because we have a really large, large area, uh, picnic area that we can host large groups on. So uh, we can easily social distance there as well. So I really appreciate uh, Susan and Chelsea putting this together. So thank you. And uh, yeah, let's have fun. But, um, you know, sing out. And if you've got any questions, I'd not, actually, I'd normally be in Chile right now. In fact, uh, I had a couple of people call me from Chile uh, because I'm not there consulting. I'm, I'm normally in Chile three, four months a year, but we've had a lot of protests down there and that's really spread the coronavirus in Chile for those who are not following South America and in Argentina as well. I would normally be there too. Um, I was a corporate winemaker basically until 2008. So I spent uh, 28 years in a corporate environment. And in 2008, I went out on my own. And today we have a company called Goldschmidt Vineyards, which is operated by my wife and myself but we have some wonderful dedicated employees um and Su and then we also have susan <laughs> they pay me once in a while yeah. just uh, and um, <clears throat> and we also uh we do a number of different things so goldschmidt vineyards is number one number two is consulting and then number three is uh i'm also an inventor and so we have a number of inventions that i'm working on and then uh fourthly uh, my background is really in viticulture. I only became a winemaker because I got sick of the winemaker telling me what to do in the vineyard when I was in Australia. I'm not Australian. I am a Kiwi. But the, um, so I went back and did analogy. So tomorrow is a really big day for me. I thought it was going to happen today, but we're pulling it as the largest, most expensive, hilliest, steepest hillside that we've ever removed. And so we're going to be pulling out this vineyard. So starting tomorrow morning you'll probably see live I'll, I'll post it live on facebook tomorrow morning at some point while i'm out there and i'll certainly be putting photos up on instagram and because it's an extremely extremely steep vineyard we've had a lot of regulatory hurdles to jump through to get this vineyard replanted so the first wine uh for those that are sitting by the bonfire which i am apparently uh is uh, Singing Tree Chardonnay. So this is a really unique vineyard. It's, um, I'm just gonna, I'm not gonna share too much tonight, but I will share uh, um, a couple of photos, which, uh, hmm, that's interesting. Uh, hang on a, hang on a second. Well, he's looking for that. I'll just say that I like the Chardonnay because it's not my mother-in-law Chardonnay. She likes it big and oaky and sugary and viscous. And this is kind of the anti-Chard Chardonnay and it's just fresh and delicious and just minimal oak on it. I think that makes it really nice. Yeah, so um, we, uh, so this is a picture of, so we have five children and uh, this is, uh, in our front yard, this is uh, Hillary and this is Catherine, a uh, couple of the dogs. So these are the wines that we're uh, we're going to taste today. And so just a little bit of reference of where we are. So Singing Tree comes from the southern part of the Russian River. So as I said before, this is the center of the universe. This is Healdsburg, and um, uh, so it's it's a bit of a drive down to to uh, 
the Singing Tree Vineyard, and then the Dutton Ranch, which some of you have got as well, it comes from the Green Valley area, which is a sub-region of the, of the, uh, of the country. But the key elements to us is this Goldridge Sandy Loam, and it's an old field selection. So these vines are extremely old. We all talk about old vine Chardonnay and old vine, sometimes we talk about old vine Cabernet, but we never talk about old vine Chardonnay. And that's, that's what this is. And this Goldridge Sandy Loam has allowed the vineyard to get really old. You can see the old vine here. The, uh, because this Goldridge Sandy Loam does not allow phylloxera to live in it. So it's got very low organic matter. And phylloxera is the insect that devastated the wine industry starting in 1988, 89. By 1990, most people were replanting their vineyards. And most of them are replanted to clones. Clones meaning that you can trace everything back to one plant. But for us, this is an old field selection. So you can see we've got big berries and small berries in the same cluster here. So it's quite unique. And uh, so because of that, because of that, we have uh, big diversity in aromatics. So when you smell this, you know, if you, were to, if you were to drink most of the Chardonnay that you drink today, as I said, is made from clones. And it typically, take, you sort of get in the high end, you'd get like stone fruit, like peaches and nectarines. And then as you get cooler, you'll get some of the, uh, what we call pip fruit, apple and pear. So it's a very tight range of Chardonnay flavors. But in this one, this is a, as I said, this is an old field selection. It's made from C, S-E-E. -E. And what you'll get when you smell it is you'll get a little bit of subtropical. So you'll get the pineapple, no, sorry, pineapple's too strong a word. You'll get um, passion fruit character. And so that gives you a sort of a, a, a little bit more interest. And you and when you smell it, you think it's gonna be big and broad and, and, and heavy, but when you drink it, it's not. And that's because we fermented in about four, we, we, we're vacillating between 40, 50% concrete. So concrete, maintains a lot of the graphite and a lot of the mineral and so you get this brightness to it and i'll just do one last. and so <clears throat> one of the key elements for me about wine is i i mean it's very easy to sell the first glass of wine no problem we can all do that but can we sell you a second glass of wine and you're only going to order the second glass if that wine perks up your palate makes you feel hungry or makes you feel thirsty and for me, I think that we have enough acidity in this wine and I leave a little bit of carbon dioxide on it. You can't really see it because it's below your threshold, but that CO2 just gives you that factor, you know, and you drink that wine, you go, damn, am I hungry or am I thirsty? And that's sort of the sensation that I really try to get with this wine. That's why it's become extremely, you know, we didn't make this wine uh, until about four or five years ago, probably. And it's just become a superstar in our portfolio. And, uh, you know, I made a living out of making Chardonnay when I was a winemaker at Simi. I mean, Simi was all about Chardonnay. And then when I was running Yellow de Mec, you know, we had Buena Vista, William Hill, Gary Farrell, Claude Bois. They were all about Chardonnay as well. So I know a lot about where all these old vineyards are. And those are the vineyards I seek out. And a lot of those growers today are having a hard time because they can't produce enough tons, tons per acre, because they're not clones. And the vineyards are relatively small. And so these large companies that I used to work for don't, they're not really interested in these small growers because they're a pain in the neck. So um, we're very lucky to be able to work with this. And I hope you get a, what do you guys think? Some of you trying it? Okay, not a lot of going on there. I, yeah, cause you guys have to, un, oh, I can unmute you guys. No, you have to unmute yourselves. You have to unmute yourselves. I think there are quite a few people who have the Dutton Chardonnay too. So they might be drinking. Yeah, so let's, Let's talk about that. So Dutton, Dutton is a really um, hello. How are you? Dutton's a really unique uh, proposition. It's a it's a vineyard that I started buying fruit from in 1990. But it was it's a very very hard vineyard to um, get fruit from. And Warren Dutton, who unfortunately has passed away, he was the original. Well, his father was the original apple farmer in the in the Russian River and and his son Warren converted a lot of the apple orchard over to growing Chardonnay as a specialty and this is the original ranch it's on a little street called Poplar Street and it's in Grayton which is an interesting little town that you may want to pass through 
but it's a very cool location. So Russian River is cool, and there's two parts that are extremely cool. The Sebastopol Hills to the south, which is where I was last night doing a, doing a virtual tasting dinner, which was interesting. And the second area is this little area called Green Valley. And the reason why I've been able to get the fruit is my very good friend, David Ramey, who you may know his winery, uh, he's gradually pulling out of Dutton because he bought another vineyard out on West Side Road. So I'm gradually taking over Dave Ramey's fruit. So this is what's really interesting about this wine is that it's, it's also made from the C selection. So it's also a field selection, S-E-E -E again. So when you, but this is a completely different wine to the regular singing tree. The regular singing tree is going to come in the mouth like this. Okay, lots of mineral and brightness, a bit of acidity, and then the finish is a little fleshy. With the Dutton Chardonnay, it's going to come in the mouth like this. So it's, it's broad on the entry and broad on the finish immediately, and it's much more classic California mm -hmm. style, but it's from this really, really cold, cold area. So um, and and we only make 100 cases made, right? Yeah, we only make less than, two, less than 200 cases, yeah. So it's, it's pretty cool. Mm -hmm. So thanks for bringing it in, Chelsea, so your um, consumers can check it out. It's awesome. You're one of yeah, the yeah we, we've had a lot of success with this wine. It's, both of the Singing Tree Chardonnays have been revised for quite a few people, but um, what are your favorite food pairings with either of these? Oh, <laughs> you know, I'm the food girl. Um, actually, the, the regular Chardonnay, I think, is really, really good with um, artichoke dip on pita chips or something like that. Just a little bit of salt, but not too much heaviness. Um, the regular Chardonnay being classic, um, you can stand a little fat. So grilled salmon, something like that is beautiful. Sea bass, um, a light lemon zest on it. You don't want too overpowering of a sauce. Um, even a grilled apricots with a little bit of goat cheese, that type of thing would pair nicely. Probably better with the regular singing tree. So there's just, it's, it's endless, but they, there's such good fresh acidity in the regular singing tree. Um, the, way I look at, the way I look at food and wine is with food, you want to have a little bit more of what's in the wine. So when Susan said using a little bit of lemon zest, so lemon is going to be a little bit more acidic. And so it's going to turn the dish the dish will actually taste more acid than the wine. So if you think the wine is acidic, if the wine is too acidic for you, add the lemon juice. Does that make sense? Yeah. You, it's and it's, and, and one of the cool thing, one of the really unique tricks that I learned was, especially with red wine, you know, when you drink young red wines, you want to drink, eat something that's fairly bitter. And that's how you make a wine taste good, you know. So eggplant is the obvious thing. So because eggplant's got a lot more tannin in it and it will actually make the, a tannic dry red wine tastes sweet and supple, you know? So uh, it's interesting when I do dinners with chefs, what they choose to, to pair with, because sometimes they're actually, you know, giving me a hard time that they don't like my wine because they're using some ingredient that's like masking what they don't like about the wine. So it, that's, that's the key thing about what, you know, what Susan's alluded to. I mean, everyone's got their own palate and we, and that's why you should never read, a wine score or a, a wine reviewer, you know, that's why you got to talk to somebody like Chelsea, because of course she lives in the area. She knows all the wine. She's tasted every wine. When was the last time Robert Parker sat down and had dinner with you? You know, <laughs> there's no, there's no relevance to what he thinks. You know, I, I find it funny that people, you know, they go to the movies and uh, they read the review and they go, well, I don't agree with that review. I liked it or I didn't like the movie, but when it comes to wine, they leave their brains outside, you know, so no, you know, it's, and, and, and wine is much more sensitive than watching a movie. I mean, it's all about, and, and the other thing too, to remember, this is fruit. This is not wood. It's not acid. It's not tannin. This is fruit. So how do we get this fruit into a condition that not only reps itself, represents itself and represents the area that it's from, but also into a condition that's enjoyable, you know? So that's kind of the big deal for me. Chelsea, food, food is king. I'll, I'll take one percent of the production. Order, order us up a couple of cases. <laughs> of the of the of the Dutton. Yes. Yeah. Well, do that. It's very well done. Good job. You know, it's, 
It's funny, last night, uh, well, sorry, not last night. Well, last night it happened too. We drank two bottles amongst uh, six of us, I think. But then at my house, all my children moved home, hence my conversation at the beginning. And uh, I thought we were going to be empty nesters by August 1st, but right now we've got seven kids. So uh, seven kids, uh, we drink at least six bottles of wine a night. And two nights ago we drank, I opened a bottle of Dutton Chardonnay and I didn't even get a glass. <laughs> the kids, well, the kids are already drunk it. You know? it up. <laughs> what? What the hell? So, uh, I know I like your kids already. <laughs> yeah, I know. I've got, I, the bottom line is, man, I don't know what's going on at home, but everyone's drinking a hell of a lot more than they used to, you know? So, because everyone's sick of, I think we're all like becoming insulated, you know? We, we, don't, we, we can't go outside, we can't socialize. So, when we do go home, and when I'm with all my kids, the small Indian village, you know, it's, um, man, just everyone's having a good, everyone's there to have a good time because it's the one part of the day that's a good time, you know? So and I can see Sadie, you're having a great time. The Marples, you're having a good time. The rest of us, we're all on our own or in a couple, you know, so. So Chelsea's got her new husband there. Who is the seventh kid then? No new husband, but I'm alone and I'm having the best time. So I don't know what you're talking about, Nick. I get all the wine. I don't have to share with anyone. <laughs> well, we did we did the Dutton Ranch on Christmas Eve with uh, scallops and lemon orzo, and it was so great with our kids and their partners. So that was really fun. That's great. I love hearing stories like that. So what I want you to do next time is take a photo and send it to me, and I'll post it on my Instagram and Facebook. People do it all around the place. Sorry, Chelsea, I changed your name. <laughs> it's true i'm keeping it <laughs> all right uh where do you want to go next susan um well I think uh, max's forefathers everybody has the forefathers oh. so good idea we'll be next nick while they're pouring that do you want to share a favorite memory of your time spent in detroit lakes i know you've been here at least once twice maybe more than that no i was just but we which time shall I share, the cold one or the warm one? <laughs> <laughs> it's always cold, isn't it, when you come to usually well, here? Well, whichever was story it, is better, obviously. Was that the one with the, was that the ice fishing one? Which story shall I tell? Well, we uh, we tried to get him up to do an ice fishing derby thing, and we and my husband loaned me all kinds of boots and hats, and he's like, they're actually driving on the lake? <laughs> he's just like, it's not going to go. But up there, I think you mocked me because my water bottle had frozen overnight. Just like, ha ha, we're in. Yeah, I know. That was crazy, man. That was like skiing. Like sometimes when we were when we were kids, we would uh, sleep in a caravan with no with no heating because we were ski instructors, you know. And you wake up in the morning and your and your socks are frozen flat, you know. And you got to put them on, and there's and there's water frozen in the frying pan, you know, or whatever the hell. I hadn't seen anything like that for a while until, well, I had a bad story in 1991 in Minnesota, but then the other one, you know, waking up in the morning and your bloody water bottles frozen. I mean, that's crazy. And when I, the first one I was in Minnesota, you know, the first time it was minus 60 with wind chill in 91. And I walked into this room, there's like 150 people. I said, how many of you have lived here for more than a year? And everyone's like, <laughs> I'm like, why? <laughs> you know, why do you live here? <laughs> So I admire you guys because I mean it really is a beautiful part of the world, and uh, yeah. Yeah. No, so crazy. one year I showed up with um, window scrapers because I had experienced frost out in California when they bring us out for the national meeting, and they're all like, "What is this?" And then I started getting notes from people. They actually started using their scrapers in the mornings. They they actually need these window scrapers. So yeah. useful tips from Minnesota. So anyway, talking about forefathers, so in 19, before I was allowed to do this in 1998, so the, the story started was when I was the chief winemaker for Louis Vuitton, uh, when Simi owned Louis Vuitton, one of the things I had to do was go to, cloud, go to New Zealand and blend um, Cloudy Bay because they own Cloudy Bay. And so I was always wondering, why am I going to Cloudy Bay to make Cabernet, Chardonnay, Merlot, Sauvignon Blanc, Riesling and everything else? Like when you think, New Zealand, or when you think Sauvignon Blanc, you think Marlborough. When you think 
Shiraz for me, McLarenville. When you think Malbec, it's Uco Valley, Argentina, and Cabernet from California. So forefathers means the forefather appellation for that variety in the new world. This is before layer cake, cupcake, and all the other bloody cakes. This is single vineyard, single varietal, and we don't sell it to the British. Because the British, any British in the uh, audience this evening? My father's British. Anyway, the, uh, because in, in England, they, they, for some reason, they, they drink more New Zealand Sauvignon Blanc and they love asparagus and cut grass and high acidity. But dude, you know, we eat Mediterranean food in California, in the US. And so we want to have something with a little bit more texture. So I make this wine, this, if, for those who have not tried this, it's a really special Sauvignon Blanc because we, when we process the grapes, we, and, and, and I don't know if you've seen this, but you go into the press and the airbag blows the grapes against the press and, and through the screens come the juice. But you also get little bits of pulp, little bits of skin and things like that. And so what I do is I leave it on those little fragments of the berry for 10 days. And during that 10 days, it picks up a lot more flavor and a lot more flesh and a lot more ripeness. And so that's, that's what makes this wine unique. Also on the label, you can't see because my lighting is so bad. Uh, this is a pair of boots that I used to wear when I walked around see me. This is my constitution that I wrote when I became an American citizen. I wrote my own constitution about friend, fish friendly farming and family farming and sustainability and organics and things like that. So you can read it on my website. This is John Hancock's signature I stole from the constitution and changed to my own. Uh, GV, obviously the G, and then Wax Eye is the name of the vineyard. And the Wax Eye is a really a unique product. They are a bird and they eat nothing but grapes and they feed for 30 miles. These things are crazy. So unlike Singing Tree, because I live in California where we have a lot of tree huggers, we're not allowed to shoot the birds. In New Zealand, these Wax Eyes, they fly in a flock of like three or 4,000. If you go outside and you shoot with a shotgun, if you don't kill seven birds, it was a bad shot. Anyway, people have started getting lazy. They start shooting through the vines because the birds are all eating the grapes. And so they're shooting through the vines. Now people are talking about finding bits of lead in the fermenters and things like that. So we don't do that. We don't do that. But really, really unique wine. We only make about uh, 1,500 cases of it, which is pretty small for a Sauvignon Blanc. And uh, I've got a little video here of standing in the vineyard. And um, I can show you that. Let's uh, jump down to that. Oh, so this is New Zealand. For those who don't know New Zealand, this is Marlborough. I was born up here in, in the far north. This is Auckland, the biggest city. Wellington is the capital down here. And Marlborough, where we are, is here. Um, everything, everything is machine harvested, and so we bring it in these big trucks. And here's a little video. G'day, I'm Nick Goldschmidt. I'm the winemaker for Forefather Sauvignon Blanc here in the Marlborough region in New Zealand. And we're standing out here prior to the 2018 vintage. And what's unique about this vineyard is we have much more water holder capacity here than a lot of other vineyards in Marlborough. We don't have a lot of stone, we have more soil, which means that we don't get as much dehydration, we don't have to irrigate as much, and hence we have a much darker, greener canopy. That also means we can push the, the ripeness a little bit further so we get more texture, more weight, more flesh, which is much more interesting for the US palate. A little fuller and richer, so the wine comes in the mouth kind of like this and has this textural element. Not too green, not too grassy, but a little bit more passion fruit. Today we're out here, we're, um, we're still about 10 days to two weeks away from Verazon. The berries are still pretty solid and uh, we've got a little way to go yet. And we expect to be harvesting here in about two months, probably. But anyway, it looks like a great vintage. We've got beautiful blue skies. We're out here in beautiful Marlborough. Anyway, 2018, Forefathers Sauvignon Blanc, Wax Eye Vineyard. Uh, stop sharing. So uh, I like that video because Susan took it. <laughs> she, was yeah, in New yeah. she was in New Zealand with me at that time. Yeah, my, my husband and I were visiting and uh, it was nice of Nick to spend a little cross time before Monty and I went to this big wine festival. It was amazing. But um, anyway, this wine, I love it because it is more viscous because it's been left on its juice leaves uh, for what, three to six months, depending on the vintage. And it's also from the, <clears throat> excuse me, from the Brancot, which is by the Wither Hills. 
And so it's the glacial soils and the berries are really small. So it's got this killer nose. And then it's got this viscous quality and that the racy acidity on the finish, which I think is absolutely perfect. It likes a little bit of fat. So like a smoked trout chowder or corn and crab chowder, something creamy, a little bit of fat, a little lemon zest just pulls it all together. So I love this wine. This is my favorite food wine that you exactly. made. And, uh, you know, so one of the other things we do a lot of in New Zealand is a lot of fresh vegetables, et cetera. So what I like to do is, uh, you know, if you get some asparagus, wrap it in prosciutto and put a little bit of lemon oil, lemon on it. Mm -hmm. uh, the asparagus cuts down the, the green characters if you don't like that so much. And then the acidity obviously makes it a little bit rounder and fleshier as well. So, yeah, anything like that. Cool, guys. Any comments? Uh -huh. Did you want to mention the sustainable um, oh, yeah. so elements of all the wine? In New Zealand, this is sustain. This is the, the symbol that means sustainability. So if you buy a bottle of New Zealand Sauvignon Blanc, make sure the symbol is on it. It's very important. And uh, there's only two other places in the world where sustainability has been enacted. Number one is in Chile, uh, especially uh, in the northern parts of Chile in Maipo and Colchawa Kachapol. And then Sonoma County, Napa County has not gone for sustainability, which I think is disgusting. But um, anyway, that's my point of view. My big deal is uh, herbicides. So I started when I first went to France, you know, you're walking into the vineyard and you realize that there's lots of insects and activity and noise and things like that. And then you walk into a vineyard in Napa and it's dead, silent. And so what we started doing was decreasing the amount of herbicide because the herbicide controls the weeds and the weeds is where the insects like to live. And so we have a number of wines now that are made from 100% organic vineyards and I'm gradually, it's tricky, it's not easy to convert to organic. That's why organic wines theoretically should be more expensive than, than normal vineyards. But we're gradually converting all of our estates over. In fact, uh, Two of my vineyards, it has to be three years to be certified. And right now I've got two vineyards that are at 18 months. And the other one, we just started about six months ago. So yeah, cool. And quite quite important for me is the is er eradication of herbicides. Please do not go to the store and buy Roundup. Anyway, my personal vendetta. All right. Um, which, wine, which red wine do you want to start with, Susan? I think... Uh... Chelsea, um, but I feel so embarrassed we spelled the name on the label wrong, right, Chelsea? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so the next group, so the Lakes Dinner Collection, they will have Catherine in their glass. And then the sitting by the bonfire, they're going to have Chelsea in their glass. So you can right. kind of touch on both. And um, it looks like everyone is enjoying eating and listening. So you're, this has been so much fun so far. So, so I'm, uh, well, since I'm sitting by the bonfire, I'm, I'm opening Chelsea. Uh, I'm glad you're starting with Chelsea. I didn't want to make a fuss about it, but I love it. What? What? I'm not allowed to. How come <laughs> you misspelled your name? <laughs> well, Susan actually, when she did the tasting at the store, she corrected that problem for me on a couple bottles. Mm. <laughs> I had a black marker and just <laughs> do I? That, well, that was easy. <laughs> so I'm pouring. I'm pouring Chelsea. So what's um. What's unique about this vineyard for me? Well, two, two, well, the main thing, of course, is that Merlot, a Merlot berry relative to Cabernet, Merlot is quite large. And so the important thing about Merlot is that you make sure you grow it on a soil that has really good water holding capacity because in California, we have a warm climate and we don't have a lot of rainfall, obviously, during the season. So we want to have a soil that holds the water for the complete season so that we don't get any dehydration because if you dehydrate it, if you turn it into a raisin, you all you're doing is concentrating sugar, acid and tannin. We don't want to do that. We want to, we want to maintain the turga of the berries so that we can extract it much more strongly when we bring it into the winery. So this vineyard is uh, just east. So the Alexander Valley looks like an upside down Y. So if you can imagine upside down Y, on the, um, at the middle of that uh, graph would be Geyserville. So Geyserville is in the middle, it's the middle town. And just to the east of Geyserville is this sandy loam soil. So really good water holding capacity. We don't have any dehydration. 
And so the second thing that I'm able to do is when we bring it into the winery, we can extract the hell out of it. So this is, this is a Cabernet drinker's Merlot. And everyone said, ah, oh, I don't drink Merlot. You know how many times I've heard that? And then I pour them this and they go, oh, it tastes like Cabernet. I'm like, well, not quite like Cabernet, but, but um, it's certainly fuller and richer than most of the other Merlots. And this is the number three selling Merlot behind Duckhorn and Decoy in California in uh, some, some of the larger independent retailers. So if you want to, if you think about spicy, because a lot of people go, oh, I don't drink, you know, I don't like green aromas. Well, the number one is, is Carmen Air. And for those who have never had Carmen Air before, it's from Chile. And I'm sure Chelsea probably has at least a bottle of Carmen Air. So Carmen Air and then Sauvignon Blanc and then Cabernet Sauvignon. If you don't like green and spicy stuff, you should be drinking Merlot. Merlot is still the number one red grape grown in the world. It's mainly right bank. I mean, if you drink a wine from Pomerol, Petrus, Aubryon, I mean, it's all Merlot. But people don't know they're drinking Merlot. And it's not like, oh, we well, have pulled all the Merlot out because people don't like drinking it. When you drink a red blend, nine times out of 10, you're drinking Merlot and Syrah, the two varietals that, were pulled, that theoretically were pulled out, but they weren't. So if you don't like Merlot, you're probably drinking it anyway, if you're drinking uh, red blends. But the key thing for me is this, is this weight. So the Alexander Valley typically gives you more red fruit, sort of, if you, if you graph warm fruit, cool fruit, so high in warm fruit would be like loganberry, strawberry, uh, red cherry, and then you get to this blueberry, you know, we talk about blue fruits, and there's no really blue fruit, but blue fruit is mid fruit, and then you go down to uh, red cherry, uh, sorry, a black cherry, plum, you know, walnut, and then you get heavier and heavier blackberry, black currant. So, what I like to see with Merlot is I like to have some red fruit. I still want to have some of that, the, uh, the uh, red cherry, a little bit of peachy character, and then the blueberry, black cherry. So I want to have, for me, Merlot should be right in the middle. And then at the same time, we want to have a little bit more texture. So by leaving it on skins a little bit longer and working the wine on the skins, I, not only can I maintain the color, so you know how wines move from purple to red to brown to orange, these wines go purple to red. They won't go brown or orange. And that's why, you know, sometimes you see on an old bottle, you see that crusty stuff here. This is not good. If you see crusty stuff here, that pigment, and it's not your birth year, the year you were born, the year you got married, the year you were divorced, whatever it is, get rid of it. Because not only is that polymeric pigment falling out, that's color, it's flavor, it's aromatics, it's tannins. The wine's falling apart. It's just aging too quickly. And that's why wines eventually go brown and orange. And so we want to avoid that. We want to try and maintain these wines in their really sound color for the longest period of time. So the first thing I do is I look at the color and I and I'm see it's, it's purple. And for those that are drinking um, Catherine, it's the same thing as well. So the, the edge of the wine should be purple and the middle of the wine should have some sort of, it should be a little bit deeper, a little bit more red. And the nose, the difference between the Cabernet and the Merlot is the Merlot you're going to get, as I said, sort of that red cherry blueberry. With the Cabernet, you're going to get more of that black fruit. You're going to get a little bit more blueberry, black cherry, a little bit of plum perhaps. And uh, in the mouth, can I taste? I'm sick of talking. So Merlot, to use a euphemism, I guess, it's going to be a little bit more like the Dutton Chardonnay, it's gonna be like fairly textural on the entry and textural on the finish and quite supple and round. Whereas those that are drinking Catherine, you're gonna get that, that suppleness and then you're gonna get this, you're gonna get a little bit more length and then you, obviously with Catherine, you're gonna get more layers on it. You're gonna get a little bit more um, oak influence. You're gonna get, and, and we leave it on skins a little bit longer. So you're gonna get a fuller, richer character. The key for me is to, to make sure the wine is not, I mean, Cabernet is supposed to be spicy, but we try and knock that spice down a little bit by giving a little bit more air during the fermentation. So we, we sort of make it an oxidized uh, way to, um, to try and elevate more fruit and take away some of the spicier character. So who's and drinking Chelsea? Just me, Susan, Chelsea, Sadie's group. Okay, Julie's group. And the rest of you drinking Cab. I actually think Sadie's group got both um, 
uh, they did both packages. So they're, um, yeah, they're well, get, getting to try them both. Um, there's a, there's, a, there's enough of them. them. They can drink them all. <laughs> <laughs> but you'll notice on, so you guys who got both there, you notice that they face different directions. And some of you have got Hillary. I don't have Hillary. But you'll notice here, the labels face different directions, right? So Chelsea and Hillary face to the left and Catherine faces to the right. So one day my wife called me and all I hear is, um, honey, I'm too drunk. I can't go to the parent teacher night at the school, right? So this is every, this is every father's worst nightmare. You gotta go to the school because it's a lose, lose, lose situation. Because if you bitch and moan that your kid is, you know, not learning fast enough, that gets back to your wife. If you complain to the teacher that she's not doing a good enough job, that gets back to your wife and you'll never get, well, maybe that's a good thing. You'll never get sent again. Well, it turned out to be a life changing experience for me. They broke the room up on first born, second born, third born twins and last born, right? So I'm on the first born table in case you didn't notice. Um, how many first borns are with me? Who's a first born? All right. Who, how, who's the last born? Oh my God. You are a special case, Chelsea. <laughs> All right. So the rest of you are in the middle. So um, this is an interesting crowd. So what do the firstborns do? Well, when we sit down at the table, none of us introduce ourselves. None of us make eye contact. I had to learn how to do this because this is not a firstborn trait. So there's a questionnaire and the firstborns go straight into the questions. We don't make eye contact. We don't say hi, nothing. We're very task orientated. Firstborns are task orientated. We've got a task, we do it. So, and at the bottom of the piece of paper, it says, elect a spokesperson for the group. So firstborns know exactly what's gonna happen. You're gonna wait 20 seconds. If no one volunteers, you volunteer. So I waited 20 seconds, put my hand up at exactly the same time as the other 13 firstborns. The secondborns are like, hey, could we get a firstborn over here? The middle children were like, what was the question? Because the firstborn, the middle children all still talking about themselves. And then the lastborns are like, we ordered a cheeseburger. We don't even know why we're here. And I see it in my kids. And that's why Kate faces the other direction because she's a middle child. Liar, manipulator, bullshit artist, thinks outside the box, challenges every day. Now, if you ask a middle child, they go, no, 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 no. We're the peacekeepers. We're the lovers. Yeah, exactly. You're manipulating. You are manipulating everybody. So anyway, that's why that label faces a different direction. And that's why Catherine is a complete. I mean, last night I did this dinner in Sebastopol. And she her, she's a vet. So she worked very close to Sebastopol. Everyone in the crowd found out that she was coming. And I said, please be wary. When she walks in, she's gonna dominate and she'll leave early. You know, it's like the seagull theory. The seagull form of meetings, you know that one, right? Where you arrive late, you shit all over everyone and leave. Okay, she walks in, everyone, oh, okay, good to see you, lovely. She stole the crowd, everyone loved her. She drank wine and told jokes and then left early. Left everybody wanting more. And that's just so middle child. We know what you're like, anyway. Did I miss anything? <laughs> no, you got it right on, right on. Yeah. You know, uh, we have a Katie in this wine tasting, and I don't know if she's finding the name familiar or the actual child numbering, but she's loving this, I can tell. She's, <laughs> she's, she's not drinking alone, though, but we can't see who she's with. I'm not a middle child, though. <laughs> Susan is, don't worry, she's making up yeah. for it. She nailed it. <laughs> Okay, okay, so this vineyard, um, this vineyard used to be, the Chelsea used to be, um, for those who remember, uh, when Clos de Bois was in his, when, uh, when Clos de Bois was a famous winery, I shouldn't say that because there's still friends of mine. When Clos de Bois was a well-known winery, they used to have a wine called Milestone, which was the very first red meritage that was ever made. And the Merlot that went into Milestone that sold for $65 is the Chelsea. So same vineyard, same winemaker, but we don't sell it for $65. We're, um, we, um, we're selling it for $20.99 tonight. Christ, Chelsea, I'm not making a living. 
I'm not making a living. I'm gonna, don't worry. <laughs> yeah, this I'll take is what it. I have to do to get you to come back to Minnesota. You really have to lay the law down. Yeah, I'm going to take it out of Susan's salary, so don't worry. Um, <laughs> well, she already works for free, so anyway. And the Catherine. Free money and willpower. <laughs> this Catherine is the same story. It's um, it's uh, from Simi. It used to be Simi's Reserve Cabinet that sold for seventy-five dollars. So same vineyard, same winemaker, and tonight we're giving it away for. Um, Twenty-one ninety-nine. Now in California, this is twenty-five dollars every day. So to have it shipped and trucked and pay for Chelsea's uh, standard of living, you know, twenty-one ninety-nine is a pretty good price, Chelsea. This is why I'm here alone. You know, I can't afford to entertain. <laughs> <laughs> oh, That's funny. I like that. Um, oh, so I've got a video here. I can show a little video, uh, Susan, of... Um, yeah, of, this is a fun one, see, you guys. You want to see that one? Uh, yeah, I do. That's a good one. Let's see if uh, where I have it. Oh, those are the kids. So this is... Um, that's Catherine, Royce, uh, Hillary, Luke, who's a winemaker in Chelsea. Uh, this is that. This is the shape of the Alexander Valley. This is Fitch Mountain. That blue dot is where I am right now. That's Hillsburg. And, uh, yeah, got 96 points in here. I don't want to show you that one. Hi, I'm Chelsea Goldschmidt, and after my workouts, I always crave a nice glass of Merlot. So, I'm obviously drinking my favorite Merlot, the Chelsea Goldschmidt. This one is 2017 from Alexander Valley. Reminds me of back home in Sonoma County while I'm here in isolation in the Bay Area. So, let's see how it is. It's the perfect wine for isolation, drink by yourself, or if you need a glass after spending the day with your family, it's always there. So let's see how it is. It smells like black cherry and pomegranate and chocolate. Yum. And it tastes like um, strawberries and plum. It's delicious. I hope you really enjoy it and I hope it keeps you company in your quarantine. Stay safe, everyone. Cheers. Yeah, so that's, uh, that's Chelsea working out, so she, working out in isolation. She, uh, since we did that video, she's now moved home. So she's working out in isolation at home now. So, um, but yeah. Hey, Chelsea, we have big party bottles of Catherine too, just in case you need, they're the one fives. Of Catherine Cabernet. Just well, case. that is definitely interesting. We might need to order some of those in. If Chelsea ever comes around, I'd probably get one of those too. Mm -hmm. She'll she'll have to do the next sales trip, I think, instead of Nick. Oh, gladly. You know, the next one, yeah. I'm just gonna have her do the class. Yeah, two middle children, and you can do it. Perfect. Well, you know, so no, she's a. Uh, Nick, you're great. She's funny as hell though, because she's doing a master's right now in biology, and. Uh, so she's between, obviously it's between semesters. So she's never worked in a winery before. So I got her a couple of interviews and she's now working in a winery doing micro for the winery. She thinks it's hilarious because we're so basic, you know, because when you look at lactobacillus, pediococcus, enucoccus, you know, so it's, um, you know, she can do that stuff with her eyes shut. She thinks that the wine industry is way behind the technology. So that's pretty cool. So it's good for her to be out there and uh, yeah. Well, if she's Funny. got the inventor gene in her, you guys might come out with some new technology soon that'll elevate everything, right? That's true. You know, we've got to get rid of this wet chemistry, man. We're going to be doing, uh, we're going to be doing much more automation. So, uh, but the problem with, you know, it's the the problem is the enzymes and how stable the enzymes are. So, anyway, hard to hard to do. All right, what are we doing next? Uh, well, the last thing about Alexander Valley, I think that makes Goldschmidt wines unique is that they're east facing vineyards. And so your tannins actually get ripe and they catch up to the wood. And I think that really makes for good balance in all these wines that you can count on Alexander Valley from Nick Goldschmidt being very good. Yeah, so we got a, I was doing a chart this, um, yesterday. So this is a, I got hundreds of these charts, but you can actually, if you go on my YouTube channel, if you go to my Goldschmidt Vineyards YouTube channel, there's about, I've just loaded them yesterday uh, in succinctly. There's called education videos and there's about 30 of them. Anyway, so each one of these charts is a different video. But basically this is, um, if you look at this line, it's uh, 
this is time. So this is when we do flowering, which we which occurred about six weeks ago. I don't know if I can get it closer, Susan. Mm. I um, so right now we're at the middle section. We're about we're almost about to go into the raison. Let's see. So so uh, this is when acidity starts off low and increases uh, to this point, and at this point we have the raison. So that's when the berries change color, and we're about to do that probably in the next three, four days. So we're very close to the berries changing color. And at this point, we start to get an increase in sugar, which is what we call bricks. And bricks is what converts to alcohol, of course, and makes Susan and Chelsea easier to put up with. <laughs> and at this point, uh, and so when we go into the vineyard, we put the berry in our mouth and I spit the pulp out. Again, you can see it if you're on my YouTube channel. I spit the pulp out and I chew the skin. Then I spit the skin out and then I spit again. And what I'm looking for is when I'm chewing the skin, I'm looking for the flavor and the tannin. And then when I spit the last time, I'm looking at the color because I can definitely see intensity of color as we get closer to maturity. So at this point, we start to get an increase in flavor and then tannins move from green to dusty to dry to ripe. And where these three things meet, usually in Bordeaux is about 100 days and that's when we harvest. But in California, we end up with like an extra month, an extra month of hang time. We can end up with 140, 145 days from bloom to harvest. So what Susan was talking about is we have a much bigger opportunity to have the tannin and flavor come into balance without getting screaming alcohol, screaming sugar. The difference is when you have a heavy crop, when the crop is heavy, like 2018, and we think 2020, when we have a heavy crop, you um it takes longer for the tannins to ripen and when you have a low crop like 2019 2017 16 15 you the uh the flavor takes longer to ripen relative to the tannin so this is the this is why vintages taste different this is why i don't make beer this is why i don't make spirits these things are boring you only get to tell the story once you know i was a brewer for three years guess what you do tomorrow the same as what you did today, the same as what you did yesterday. The most important thing with beer is make it taste the same. The most important thing with wine is make it taste different, make it interesting. It's from a place, it's from a soil, it's from a different person. And then every vintage has its different impact. And so making wine is far more interesting. And that's why you should never just focus in on one wine, one label, one brand, one price point. You just float around try different stuff you know talk to chelsea and and find out what she's long on and she needs help selling anyway no i didn't mean that um <laughs> hey nick i yeah. got a question for you when you say that um it's heavy or if it's low are you talking about the number of of grapes in a cluster the yield the tonnage what are you referring to well it's very that's a very it's a great question and very hard to answer but because when we, if I said to a distributor or if I said to Chelsea, you know, Chelsea, you could ask me that same sort of, that's the same, that's the sort of question a retailer would ask me. And I'd say, and I look at them and I go, hmm, I wonder how much they understand about grapes. Because if I say it's four ton an acre, they're going to go, oh, must be good. If I tell them it's five ton an acre, they go, oh, I don't know, it might be a little dilute. If I say six or seven or eight ton an acre, they go crazy. I'm not going to buy that wine, you know? So if I say it's two ton an acre, they go, oh my God, it must be unbelievable. But it's not about tons per acre. It's what you just said. It's about how many berries in a cluster. It's about how many clusters on a per, on a per vine basis. Because when I say per acre, I could grow 1,500 vines on an acre. I could grow 3,000 vines on an acre. So which is it? So what we like to look at is how many how many buds per meter, which the industry standard is 15 buds per meter. And then each um, shoot, each bud produces two clusters. So we look at pounds per vine or kilos per plant, you know, so that's the way we like to look at it. But it really is a bell shaped curve. If this is quality and this is tons, the bell shaped curve can look like this or it can look like that, depending on the soil. If you're on the top of the hill in the very thin soil, your elasticity of, of tons and quality is very tight. So that's why the curve looks like that. So you could move between three ton and four ton. It's a very tight 
rule. If you're on a more loamy soil, more fertility, and that's why Chardonnay is usually grown on heavier soils, your bell-shaped curve is much different. But I, you know, I make wines at eight ton an acre that have scored 90 plus points. So I'm not saying that just because theoretically 10 to, uh, eight ton an acre is too heavy. No, it's because that vineyard had 3,000 plants on it. You know, so it's very hard to answer that question without actually walking to the vineyard. But the whole thing is about balance. 15 buds per meter, 13 leaves per shoot, and two clusters. So that's what we look at. But yeah, and every year me, is if different. Someone, if someone comes in and they're describing a wine as heavy, I think mouthfeel right away if that's my first indication of it. But it can mean so much more, which is why it's nice to discuss, you know, lots about it. So. I think um, now I've got older and more sarcastic, um, in case you didn't notice, I, uh, I, I, I spend way more time looking at color than I ever did. And the main reason is, is because now I've made wines in the Alexander Valley for 31 years and in the Napa Valley for 28 years. And so I can go back to those vintages. I remember, I remember, I can't tell you what year my children were born, but if you ask me what the vintage was like, I can tell you. I know it's crazy. So um, don't worry, Susan, I know you were born before me, so I know your, your year. Uh, so, <laughs> um, it's yeah, going to come back around. What's that? Nothing. I'm just going to change your name. No, no. <clears throat> Uh, so, um, <laughs> <laughs> I thought it might be older than dirt. That's what I was predicting. I love all this newfound power. I never had this before. Um, so, um, yeah, I like, and it, and it's, and I, and I really know, I, I learned this starting in 1993. Uh, sorry. Yeah. 1993, 1993 was not an easy vintage. It was, a, we had hot and cold spikes and it was a little bit difficult. The crop rate was a little bit, a little low and, and then at the end of the season, we got this massive heat spike and everything dehydrated and turned to raisins. So that year, I started to really focus on manipulating the tannins, trying to make the wine softer and more fruity because it was not an easy year because I knew that was down the stream of what that wasn't going to be very fruity. And that's when I started working on making sure the color was extremely stable. And so if I go back to 94, when I really started implementing this thing, those, I, in fact, I had a bottle of 94 about three weeks ago that I'd made. The wine is purple. You know, it hasn't shown any of that brown or brown or orange character in it. And that's, I think that's, that's part of what mouthfeel is. Color gives you, is a great indicator of acidity, flavor and tannin. And, and that's what eventually leads to mouthfeel. It's not often you get a red or purple wine and you drink it and it's dilute. That doesn't happen very often. So, um, yeah, color is a really good indicator of, of volume. And um, I guess that's why everyone uses antique glass. So you can't see what color the wine, <laughs> you can't see what color the wine is, but yeah. But don't you notice it with rosé too? I think, I think with rosé, they can become so uh, fleshy and sam salmon color, they all, they're almost dilute. You know, I want to have a little bit of color because I want to have, I want to have rosé that, um, you know, if you, if you go in and buy a bottle of rosé, try a darker colored rosé just for a change rather than that salmony, pinky, Frenchy thing. So um, look for something. There are a lot tomorrow. of different shades of rosé. When are we going to get a rosé from you, Nick? Uh, well, not deliberately. <laughs> I'm a big fan of rosé, so I would uh, like, like to I, see a I can't, rosé. I, I can't. Yeah, well, we made rosé for a couple of years out of Napa Valley, but I can't, I can't make everything well, you know. I have to, like, limit myself. And rosé is really... The problem with rosé is to make a really good rosé is really expensive because you need to harvest the grapes and press the grapes to make a rosé. You can't crush a red fermenter and bleed it or what we call so we pull juice out of a main ferment and because the problem with that is you get too high in alcohol and uh i don't want to do that i want to make a legitimate rosé i don't know maybe i could try it this year we've got a lot of excess fruit lying around i could probably pick up a few tons how many cases you want chelsea 
Let's talk about the quality before we get a case count. How about that? I don't believe in that. If you don't like my wine, <laughs> if you don't like my wine now, then uh, I mean, well, senior... I've liked everything so far. Whoa, whoa, whoa! What is one year older got over there? See me, see me, see me. Uh, we made a living out of rosé. We made rosé for a long time. The new see me rosé is not made traditionally, though. It's made out of it's a bleed, so it's not as interesting. Well, I hope no one's from constant. So we're not making this anymore, and it's gone. But Chelsea, I'm going to put your name on it. <clears throat> And I'll make sure you get it. It's called uh, Lady L. It's a Napa Rosé. And well, uh, no, it's is not. That? It's just we a little excited about that one. It's the 16, <laughs> but we just had it at Antunia's, and it was very tasty. But you're never going to see it again. So I'm going to give it to you, Chelsea and Stuart, if you two want to share it sometime, or we'll drink it together. Okay, Sounds I'm going to put your name on it. Okay, that'll be, that's the last bottle Thank ever. Thank you. Yeah. You're crazy. We'll tie that and we'll wait for the next release from Mick. Well, Chelsea, so, Chelsea's second name is Ella. That's where Lady Ella comes from. Mm -hmm. It was made for her engagement party and a little bit more for the wedding a year ago or something, two years ago? Yeah, a couple of years ago. Yeah. No. All right, All right, so then um, then we've got Hillary. We want to, let's just, let's just see if we can find the... Uh, so in the next round, the... Um, Lakes Dinner Collection. They have Hillary, and then um, the Sitting by the Bonfire crew has Yardstick. So whichever Napa cab you end up with, they'll both be delicious. Um, and I just got, I know we talked about um, ratings. So for me, I use ratings in my position to, if you're, I, you, it's kind of stylistic. So all of wine is subjective. You can like it, you cannot like it. Nobody has to like the same thing. That is 100% fine. But if you tend to like Robert Parker's ratings, I can kind of put you in a category to suggest different wines for you. So that's how I use the ratings is to kind of skew where my customers might stylistically shop. But if you only follow ratings, that's great for some winemakers too, because it works out well. But um, just be wary that not everything is going to be for you that may be high rated or low rated. You should certainly do your own research, but, um, I think it's great. You guys have some other accolades. That's wonderful. You want to talk about the newest? Yeah. So Hillary is, um, it's, if you don't, if you don't buy the Hillary, if you buy Napa Cabernet and you don't buy Hillary, you're crazy. Um, so let's just jump down to, uh, all right, well, let's, let's, let's just look at this map here for a second. And so, if you don't buy at the pre-order price, you're even crazier. Yeah, that's true. So this is, um, this is Highway 29, right? This is, uh, and this is St. Helena, and this is Napa. So if you head south, you'll, um, you'll get to, this is Fagnente. For those who know Fagnente. This is Mondavi. This is Nickel and Nickel. This is Opus, and that's Hillary. So nickel, nickel, Hillary, Opus. $280 at Costco, $320, 50,000 cases, and I'm not at bloody Costco. And right there is the beautiful nickel, nickel winery, and their vineyard, and that's Hillary down there at that end, and there's Opus, beautiful Opus, out here in the Oakville, getting ready to pick Hillary tomorrow. Cabernet Sauvignon, Oakville, Napa Valley. So yeah, I mean, if you think about the best value or the cheapest Oakville Cabernet you can buy today is Mondavi. Mondavi Oakville is $75. And today you can buy Hillary for, uh, I think it was 49, yeah, 49.99. Out here in California, it's 55. And it's like the, the best value. So there's three wines that we can't be beat on. The Singing Tree Chardonnay from Russian River. You can't buy Russian River Chardonnay for that price. Catherine Cab uh, and the Hillary. So those three, and above that, we've got Game Ranch, which is still a, also a phenomenal price at 85 bucks for a single vineyard Oakville, which is a little bit further down. $76, but... And all of these are 100% vineyard variety, vintage, and vegan. So there's no blending. It's 100% Chard, 100% Cab, 100% Merlot, which is amazing. Yeah. So I believe if you have the best vineyards, you don't need to blend. So, um, yeah. 
All right, and then uh, for those who are sitting by the bonfire with me, you are drinking Yardstick. Now, the Yardstick bottle is really unique for those who's, who have it in front of them. So it has, the Yard is a, um, so this is, this is my knock at my British and American ancestry. So the Yard is the original form of measurement, means three feet, right? So just like three feet or the Yard is the old measurement, Napa Valley is the old measurement for Cabernet. It's time to move on, folks. Yes, I have a lot of Napa Cabernet to sell, so don't um, don't knock me completely. But it's time to move on. Just don't just because you can't find just because there is no Napa Valley Cabernet available to you doesn't mean you can't drink Alexander Valley. It's a very good place too. So one day I was in Houston and I was telling the story about the British and Americans. You know, the last two imperialistic nations in the world, and they can't even agree on the same size of a gallon. I don't know if you know this, but a, an English gallon is 4.54 litres and a British gallon is 3.7. Anyway, so the British and Americans got together and they sent this uh, satellite out to Mars. It was about 10 years ago now, I'd say. It's a great story because it arrived at Mars and then disappeared off the radar. It was a $1.8 billion mistake. And the British called the Americans up and said, I thought you said left-hand thread. And the Americans said, I thought you were talking metric. <laughs> So I'm in Houston telling the story. Everyone's laughing except for one table. I go up and talk to them. And guess what? They're all from NASA. And I say, well, how close is my story? And they go, oh, unbelievable. So close. So apparently the satellite arrived at Mars. The legs popped out and it plummeted to Mars because I thought it was already there and it was 100 feet away. So right now today on Mars, there's a little divot with a $1.8 billion satellite stuck in it. <laughs> So that's what yardstick is. This is what yardstick is. Anyway, it, it, so it's the only thing, everything we do in Napa Valley is from Oakville except yardstick. And this comes from Yontville. So, Yont, so it goes Rutherford, Oakville, Yontville. So Yontville's a little bit cooler uh, than Rutherford. I know it's further south, which means it should be warmer, but no. When the sun comes up in the morning, it shines at Mount St. Helena, and that sucks the fog off San Francisco Bay and the fog moves up Valley. So that's why Yontville is cooler than, uh, than uh, Oakville and Rutherford. So it's a unique area. The wine's called Ruth's Reach, and that's named for my sister. Her name is Ruth. And uh, she always used to reach across the dinner table. She was rude as hell, because in our family, you, only, you don't ask for anything. People have to notice that you want something else to eat and should be passed to you automatically. But my sister, Ruth, she always used to reach across the table. People think it's to do with... Uh, you know, water or uh, a little bit of peninsula or whatever, but no, it's all to do with a mockery of my sister. So every wine has a story. And she was the baby. You know, you know what young children, are, baby children are like right there. It's all about them. So that that's why it's made made for her. So cool. what are your favorite classic pairings with your Napa cabs, and what's a fun, unusual pairing that you like to do? Well, let me put it. Let me put it this way, Tim. And tonight will be another example. So the big thing for me is, is what, what, wines, what wines act like, a, what, what red wines act like a white wine when it comes to eating and drinking. So, you know, you want to have a mouth that, you want the wine to make your mouth feel alive. And so Alexander Valley has got more red fruit, more acidity. So typically I recommend drinking red wine with dinner. Uh, sorry, Alexander Valley with dinner and Napa Valley after dinner because that's with the cheese course with the fats and everything like that. I mean, we're a big cheese. I'm a big cheese fan, so that's what I do. So I, I typically drink Alexander Valley is going to be a little bit more red fruit, a little bit more acidity, a little bit more relative to, um, to, uh, to what you're eating. So obviously for me, I mean, I'm a, I eat a lot of meat. So, you know, skirt steak, flank steak, open fire, smelly, smoky shit. That's what I like. And then some people, depending on the spicy character, depending on the vintage, depends on how green a character I want to add to it, you know, whether it's rosemary or whether it's mint or whatever it is. But, you know, these days with the 2018 Catherine, I'm using a lot of rosemary just because it, it really acts well. But Susan probably knows better. She's the foodie. Well, Alexander Valley, of course, has a little bit more herbal characteristic and a little bit more earthiness. So I like mushrooms and herbs and things like that with Catherine. But with Napa, 
I need to make sure that the sauce is really kind of neutral. I don't want the sauce to be so powerful that you miss the good parts of the Napa, which I think is really gorgeous. But I think even more gorgeous is the Hillary because it's got really focused big tannins. But I still think like a beef bourguignon, something just nice enough, just a beautiful petite a tenderloin, you know, something that's not too much of anything, just maybe a little mushroom cap, maitre d' butter, and you're good. Because you really want to taste this. You do it, hit it with a heavy sauce and lots of this and that. You just mess out on the wine. And you got to watch your heat spices. If it's too spicy with red pepper flakes and things like that, it just, it totally masks all the fruit. So keep it, keep the spice dial down so you get the spice out of your cabinet. <clears throat> One thing I use a lot of is um, when I'm in Argent when I'm in Chile, there's a, they have a product called Marquen. Marquen is a, um, it's like smoked paprika. So using a little bit of that, you can dial that up and down, you know, right on the dinner table. So um, I find that works really well with the Alexander Valley. I wouldn't do it with the Napa because the Napa is going to be more, you know, it's more fatty, more textural. But. Well, I'm very spoiled because I have gorgeous wines and my rep Stuart foraged for chanterelles this morning and dropped some off to me before. So I'm nice. just living a dream over here. I don't share. I keep them all. Stuart shares, yeah, but I don't share. Yeah. <laughs> oh, we can, we can, awesome. we can. So does anybody else have any questions? Please feel free to ask Nick anything. I do want to get one sheep joke before we sign off, but other than that, you just shoot anything at him. He'll answer it, I'm sure. I changed your name too, Chelsea. It's now come on over. I'm having mushrooms. <laughs> Hey, Nick, Corey Maple here. So I've been drinking the Hillary scent for the last couple hours since my wife made some pork chops with it. Delicious. How long can a guy age that? Well, it sounds like it's already open, so I'd say a few hours. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's good. <laughs> but if I, if I buy, it's, it's really delicious. If I, if I laid it down for three, four, five years, is it good? Oh, no, yeah, no problem. No, look. You know, for me, the wines, I either, I either drink wine under a cork, not under a screw cap, but under cork, I like to drink the wines really young or really old. Well, really old in terms of I don't want, the, I don't want any crusty stuff on them. So, Hillary, I can show you a Hillary that I made in uh, 2003, right? So, what's that, 17 years now? Yes. Still purple. Right on. Okay. So, and this is why I, Susan knows this joke. I, I find it really funny that the uh, wine enthusiast came out with an article that said the 40 best winemakers under 40 years old. They're exactly the wines I'm not going to drink. Because why would I drink a wine from a winemaker that doesn't even know the vineyard, let alone having made wine from the same vineyard for more than 10 years? And so when Kim Jong-un drops a nuclear bomb in California, we all run to the bunker and you show up with you, you show up with your one bottle of Opus, and I show up with my three six packs of Hillary for the same price. Get who they're going to let in. We're going to be down in that bunker a long time, dude. One bottle's not going to last. <laughs> I'll let you in, Nick. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Man, there's an invitation I can't turn down. <laughs> well, and for people who are just getting into like laying wines down or aging them, I think that my best advice is to buy a case or two. And to kind of drink it for a little bit, you know, you drink one a month or one a cup, you know, a few times a year just to see how it ages. And you save some for a while down the road, but it just gives you a different perspective on that wine that you're cherishing, which is kind of fun too. So, yeah, I always tell people buy a case of wine, open and bottle them up. Why is it they sell wines in a 12 pack? It's 12 months, baby. That, well, that wine's... Chardonnay is a six pack. That must mean something extra special, right? <laughs> Well, you but that, somebody brought that up the other day. Like, this is why they sell wine in a 12 pack. You should only buy wine in a 12 pack because then you know how to age. And then you drink one bottle every month and you go, and then call me when the month was the best. <laughs> so, well, well, you know, how much do I have left? But it's an interesting perspective. And, I, and the other thing to remember, and I cannot do this for you. You're the only one that can do this. And people call me up and they go, Nick, I had a bottle of your Catherine Cabernet. It was the best wine I've ever had in my life. 
And then I opened it up six months later. It was the worst wine I've ever had in my life. I'm like, when did you have the first one? Well, it was a Friday night. I'd finished work. I asked my wife, a girlfriend to marry me. We drank a bottle of Catherine. It was the best thing. When did you drink the second one? I came home from work. It was a Monday. I was yelling at my wife. You know, no wonder. No wonder you didn't like the second bottle. So memory and point of reference is also really important. It's not just... Uh, I took from gonna... that, be really good to your wife and take care of your wife. That's what I got from that story. But I'm a winemaker. <laughs> what more does she want? Right. Well, so I'm not wrong. There, I mean, there are years that are but produce better wines, yes? Well... The conversation could get even better. That's a very, very good question. So if we were to look at California, this is why I live in California. The last mediocre vintage we had was 2011. All right, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19. If you did that in France, okay, now there are exceptions. In the 80s, 82, 83, uh, 88 and 89, bad vintages. 88 was hot, small berry. 89 was rotten. Uh, 83, rained every two, three days, terrible. And then we got into the 90s. The weakest vintage of the 90s was, was 93. Well, that wasn't even that bad of it. The only reason why 93 was a bad vintage was because it was a low crop. We had too much canopy and the thing ripened too quickly. Then in the 2000s, the weakest vintage we had was probably uh, probably 2003 again, probably a three vintage. But I mean, seriously, I mean, 30 years I've been making uh, wine in the Alexander Valley and I can name four weak vintages. And 2011 was not a bad vintage. The reason is, is because, you know, California is this long. New Zealand is this long. Japan is this long. England is this long but it rained here and everybody thought the vintage was bad here. It's seven hours from the cent from Healdsburg to the central coast. But because it rained in the central coast nonstop for three weeks, everyone thought it was a bad vintage. 2011 is a dream vintage. It was cooler, like 2010. 2010 and 11. Correct that 94 was an exceptional year. That was the year I came to Cabernet and I drank, I drank $30 bottles of Camus Cabernet all winter long. Yeah. Uh, not knowing what I was drinking until the next year it came out and it was $55 a bottle. But, but 94, I mean, I remember that just being the best yeah. wine I ever drank. And then I'm really fond of the, I have a, I don't know, you might know Anomaly. They're a little wine vineyard there, but uh, they're south there over um, the other way. But, you know, their 2015s are just wowing me. So, uh, yeah, you know. What did you say? 2004. What'd you say? 94. 94. 1994 and then 2015s yeah. are really wild. Yeah. So 90, 94 was, um, was a lower crop year. 95 was more flashy. So the, the big comparison for me would be 86 versus 87. So 86 was very elegant, round, supple. And then 87 came out and the press went crazy. Now, if you go back and drink 86 versus 87 today, 86 kicks ass. It's the same thing with 2004 and five. Five was a flashy vintage, round, supple, but 04 had better acidity. And if you drink, if you have to compare 04 to five now, I'd take 04 any day. But again, I'm splitting hairs. If you were to take, like, let's say we've had four bad vintages, four mediocre vintages in 30 years. I'm not counting the 80s. So starting in 1990 till now, we have four mediocre vintages. If you did that in France, you'd have 20 mediocre vintages. And this is why buying wine in California is much more safe proposition. But again, I'm a supple green, I mean, I'm a supple round tannin guy. So I, I'm only going to drink Napa Sonoma. I don't, I'm not a big central car. I'm not a big Paso guy because I find the tannins more aggressive. Um, and I'm certain. And I think Nick, that some my, my customers too, they maybe aren't like super like, Oh, vintage to vintage, but they do wonder how like the, the fires and the smoke taint will like work into the wines that we'll see yeah. or if it won't even work at all, you know? So that's, that's a real problem. Cause trying to explain for me, the guaiacol and for the guaiacol, um, methyl guaiacol to consumers is tricky. So what it is, is 
the best way to describe it is, is the fires, when we have fires in California, which will probably happen again this year, when we have fires in September, October, it means nothing. Yeah. But if we had fires today, it is really bad. Because right now, we're going through Verizon. So the leaves, the green leaves at the bottom of the canopy are highly photosynthetic. So we're transpiring a lot. Now, if you put a, a, if you put a fire today next to a vineyard, those leaves are gonna absorb smoke and that smoke goes straight into the cluster. This is why you don't wanna grow grapes next to garlic field, onion field, eucalyptus or anything like that. Now, if you have a fire in September, October, it's irrelevant because the leaves cannot absorb the smoke. They've already senesced. The only way you get smoke taint from a fire in September is if the ash of the fire lands on the cluster and that ash comes into the winery. Yes, you'll get smoke taint. But in general, no. So, and if, for those who understand Britannomyces, which is the tertiary yeast, that the spoilage yeast that is mainly in a lot of French wines, it's the same, uh, that's the same phenol that you get from smoke. Anyway, so it gives you that. But if, it, if for those who want to know what smoke taint tastes like, you know when you're a kid and you thought it was really cool to smoke menthol cigarettes? That's the taste. Menthol cigarettes. You're on I mute. think we're all super happy that you took time out of your day and oh. chatted with us about these awesome wines. I know some people have had the opportunity to meet you at Spanky's or in your other expeditions to DL, and it won't be your last. I know you'll be back. So I oh, know. The I'm next definitely... time, all these people will invite you out on their pontoons, their ski boats. You'll have plenty of places to stay. You'll have it all set up, Nick. Oh, I bring the wine, baby. I'm coming. Remember, oh. remember the ice fishing. Oh, yeah. <laughs> No, no, you know, the, the funny thing is, I live on Dry Creek River, and I mean, I can stay and talk all night. I'm, I'm, uh, anyway, I, I don't get to hang out with people very often, right? <laughs> anyway, I live on Dry Creek River, and um, uh, so I went down to the county and I said, Oh, can I teach my children how to fish in the Dry Creek River? And they said, What are you kidding me? No way, you know, that's where the steelhead come from. The, uh, the rainbow trout the, and the, I forget what the other one, there's three, for, the coho, the coho salmon. Because that's an, you know, this is the Dry Creek River is where the spawning ground is and up the top of the, where the lake is, that's where they, they catch them and breed them and all that. So then I said, well, would you notice a gill net for five minutes? Like the guy didn't even laugh. Anyway, so went home and told the story and Hillary was, I don't know, Hillary was about four or five when this happened. So she went out back one day and she got one of my fishing rods and she went down to the river and she threw it in the river with her friend and they caught a salmon <laughs> in Dry Creek River. So they get, the, they get the rod and they put it under a rock so the salmon can't get away and they don't lose the rod. You know, I don't know what, what she was thinking. She came up to the house and said, I caught a fish. I'm like, dude, you can't catch any fish. They had to go down there at least. But it's an, uh, yeah, that's my sense of fishing. I think standing on an, you know, on an ice, on a piece of ice on a, in a little box with a, with a heater going and uh, drinking brandy. You haven't been in the right ice fishing houses. Yeah. Some of them rival any hotel room you've ever been in. Really? Uh, oh, yeah. yeah. But don't you have to tow them out with your four-wheel drive. I mean, what's, where's, where's the glory in that? You have it all set up before you even get there. Don't even worry about it. <laughs> it's all, right. all there for you. You can find you somebody with a nice... Line. Yeah, and you can watch it come up. You pull it up through the hole, and you can see it swimming up. It's awesome. <laughs> okay, well, you find all the audio and visual that you need. What? <laughs> Hi, Tech, around here. What? You got a camera in the water? Yeah, couple of them. You guys are weird. <laughs> oh my god. Well, you don't need to pay attention if there's no fish down there, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, that's true. All right, man. Okay. You gotta hit me with a sheep joke before we finish. Yeah, sheep joke. I don't know which one you want to hear, Susan. Hmm. I, I don't know. We, I don't know. <laughs> Pretty sheep. Oh, I told the answer already. <laughs> I can't do that one. <laughs> How about Not I don't know. <laughs> that one. Oh, uh, that one. 
Uh, no, I can tell. I'll tell a joke. So I like that one too. I know what she's talking about. Actually. No, so there's uh, there's um, which one shall I tell? All right. So there's a uh, there's uh, an Australian. No, there's a Kiwi. I'll change jokes. There's a Kiwi. There's a Kiwi. He's standing out there with his flock of sheep, and this um, guy comes up and says, "If I can guess how many sheep are in your flock, can I have one?" The New Zealander says, "Yeah, sure, mate." And he goes, 2,383 sheep. The New Zealander says, that's amazing. You got it right. So the guy goes, well, can I have a sheep? And the New Zealander says, yep, pick the prettiest sheep you can find. I want you to pick the prettiest sheep and you can have it. So the guy picks one up and starts walking away and says, uh, starts walking away. The New Zealander thinks about it for a minute. And he goes running up to the guy and he goes, you're Australian, aren't you? And the guy goes, damn, how did you know? New Zealander says, put my goddamn dog down and I'll tell you. <laughs> anyway, there you go. Up, drink up, guys. I love that. Thank you, Nick, so much. This Thank has been you. such an honor having you here. Um, if anyone else has questions, please shout them out. He'll be happy to stick around and answer anything you have to ask. And for the pre-order sheets, there was some in your bag and some emailed to you. So if you would like to fill that out, and get that back to me before Monday or Tuesday, I'll let it slide. Um, we'll get those ordered for you and then I will give you a call. We can take care of payment and we'll bring it right out to your car when you pull up to the store. So thank you again, Nick. This has been so awesome. I hope you have much success with your other video conferencing classes and that whole uh, wine, the um, food pairing virtual thing sounded very interesting, but um, People and have to branch out. They got to get strong in the food game and the wine game, and you're happy to guide us on both. So, and I expect you. that his 